The following lecture is brought to you by the Boot Camp Subcommittee of the Committee on Resident Education of the Society of Neurological Surgeons. Understanding spacing, orientation, and environment within the operating room is critical. Personnel commonly include surgeons, anesthetists, nurses, techs, neurophysiology, students, and potentially lawyers. Attention must be paid to variations in equipment and tools, as well as keeping noise to a minimum. Physicians need to communicate and respect their coworkers. Preparation is key, as well as the ability to assist. Remember, positioning the patient is an art form. It takes years to learn correctly. You and your patient will suffer if you do not learn to do it correctly. Here is an example of the setup for a right craniotomy, illustrating the close interaction between surgeons, anesthesiologists, and operating room staff. Good organization is crucial. When positioning, keep in mind the following principles. Line of sight, patient comfort, venous outflow, brain relaxation, Surgeon comfort, pressure points, harvest sites, central venous access sites, pin placement, and multidisciplinary cooperation. Here's an example of appropriate patient positioning for a left sided terional. When applying the Mayfield head holder, Attempts should be made to avoid pinning the temporalis and suboccipital musculature. The orange areas are target sites for pin placement. Pin placement needs to be secure and away from the incision site. Here are examples of how to pin for various approaches. The timeout must be performed prior to incision. During the timeout, stop and pay attention. Anyone in the room can pull the stop cord. There is zero tolerance to not doing it. Do it correctly or do it over. Do it respectfully. After it is done, there is time to review with the team the steps and the flow of the operation. During the timeout, the team must confirm patient identity length of procedure, type of procedure, surgical site, Foley catheter placement, prophylactic antibiotics, steroids, mannitol, dilantin, etc. All necessary equipment must be present in the room, along with blood and blood products, ICU availability, and frozen section. Shaving preferences vary by neurosurgeon and patient. As a resident, you must know what the attending wants and what the patient wants. Most neurosurgeons prefer to shave hair on the incision site. Hair sparing craniotomies, however, are becoming more and more common. Hair near the incision needs to be prepped and draped with standard sterile technique. Studies have demonstrated no difference in the incidence of infection between shaved and hair sparing craniotomies. Prepping must be done from inside to outside. As a general rule, prep wide and drape narrow. The prep must be allowed to dry as most agents are active on contact. Remember, alcohol is flammable. Each attending has their own rituals. Be familiar with them. Personal scrub is an important part of the prepping and draping process. Scrubs should be changed between cases to avoid cross-contamination, especially in cases of infection. Aseptic technique is critical. 
Scrub the skin with betadine or chlorhexidine solution for at least five minutes. Avoid contact with eyes. Always remember that the cost of infection is high, particularly with expensive implants. The scalp has five layers, which can be remembered by the mnemonic SCALP for skin, subcutaneous tissue, aponeuresis, loose areolar tissue, and pericranium. When planning the incision, remember the following principles. Access to the lesion, the adjuvant treatments to come and the possibility of reoperation, and wound healing issues. The closure starts with the opening, remembering to try and preserve the scalp's blood supply, which is composed of five major arteries and a rich anastomosis. The scalp's innervation is also critical when performing a nerve block. Know the bony anatomy of a skull, including the number and location of each bone, geometric shape and orientation, sutures, and muscular attachments. Here is a diagram illustrating the vascular supply to the scalp. Attempts should be made to preserve the major branches when performing the exposure. Here is a diagram illustrating the innervation to the scalp. Attempts should be made to preserve the major nerves when performing the exposure in order to avoid numbness and muscle atrophy. The frontalis branch of the facial nerve must be preserved when elevating the scalp over the orbitozygomatic region. Here is a diagram illustrating the course of the nerve and the layer it travels in. You must have a thorough understanding of this anatomy when performing these approaches in order to avoid a frontalis nerve palsy. This diagram illustrates the standard craniotomies that are the workhorses for the majority of cranial neurosurgical cases. Frontotemporal, temporal, parietal, and suboccipital. The galea is the strength layer of the scalp and should be sutured together upon closing. Here is another image demonstrating the galea, the superficial temporalis fascia, the fat pad, and the facial nerve. Incisions can be divided into five major types, curvilinear, bicoronal, straight or lazy S, reverse question mark, and U-shaped. Here is a curvilinear incision. Note the attempts to preserve the major blood vessels. It is key to make the base of the flap wider than the height, making sure to provide an adequate vascular pedicle. Here are bicoronal and lazy S incisions. This is the reverse question mark. Again, note the attempts to preserve major blood vessels. Here is a U-shaped incision. A trauma flap incision typically constitutes a large reverse question mark incision that exposes the frontotemporal parietal region.